I guess we're ready to go. Uh, more thinking about confidence intervals. So going back to where we started, uh, again, I'm, re I'm reiterating this so many times. If you really got this, go ahead and skip ahead. But if you're not 100% sure, listen to the explanation again and think through it again about 1,000 times until you've got it because it's pretty important. So the thought experiment that we conduct when we make confidence intervals is that we collect a sample. Well, that's not a thought experiment. We actually collect a sample and we calculate the mean and the, st and the standard deviation and the sample size and all this kind of stuff. And then we start the thought experiment. We imagine very specifically, zillions of samples with the, same, with the same sample size as our observed sample, as the sample we actually collected. And that's the sampling distribution of means, as long as we calculate a mean from each of those samples. So if our sample was uh, 25 individuals, then we imagine bazillions of samples of 25 individuals from the same sampling distribution, and we imagine calculating a mean from each of those bazillions of samples. And that distribution of all the means is the sampling distribution of the means. And we don't have to see it to know what its properties are. We can know what its mean is and what its standard deviation is with some pretty minimal assumptions that are generally fairly reasonable or at least uh, useful and not crazy as much as it seems like they might be. So we specify the mean of that sampling distribution. And we say that that mean of the sampling distribution is the same as the population mean that the sampling distribution came from. And we're going to say that the population mean has our sample mean as well lay out in a second here. We specify the sampling distribution's standard deviation, which we call the standard error, and there's a little formula to calculate that. And then we find the middle 95% or 90 or 90% of that sampling distribution because it's normal at this point. And if it's not normal, we can't use this process. So assuming that we can determine that it's fairly normal, then we can just use z-scores to find the middle 95% or 90%. Just z-scores and the normal probability table. It's pretty easy. And then we have two numbers, the lower limit and the upper limit of that 95% or 90% or 99%. And then our conclusion is we are 95% or whatever confident that the true mean, so mu, that the true population mean lies between, and then we give our two numbers. That's what we got. So the logic of why we use our sample mean as the population mean and therefore as the mean of the sampling distribution of the means is like this. We don't know what the population mean is. We have no idea, but we have one estimate, and that estimate is our sample mean. So we, so we do what we do. We do point estimation. We say our best guess is that the uh, population mean is our sample mean. And when we say we assume or we guess, etc., or we, or we, you know, do apply such and such, it has consequences in math. So this means we write that number down on the graph of the population um, raw scores of all population raw scores. So we say that that distribution of raw scores has the same mean as our sample. And now mathematically we know that the mean of the means is the mean. So the mean of all of the means, so the mean of the sampling distribution of the means has to be the same as the mean of the raw scores. So basically we've said that the mean of the sampling distribution is the same as our sample mean. So we set our sample mean as the middle. And we just kind of are going to go a certain amount above our sample mean and a certain amount below. It was kind of a convoluted process of the logic to get there, but that's all we do. Just a confidence interval is just our sample mean plus or minus a certain number. So we have conditions, sometimes called assumptions, for doing confidence intervals. And the conditions aren't actually for doing confidence intervals. They're for using the normal approximation. We have to use the normal approximation to calculate these confidence intervals. There are other approximations you could use, other distributions. There's other methods that don't use approximations. But for this class, we're going to do the most common thing, which is using the normal approximation to calculate confidence intervals. But before you can use the normal approximation, you have to be pretty sure that things are normal. And from here on out, everything has conditions or assumptions because we want to do certain things to guess or estimate population values, and we have to make certain um, assumptions about what's going on in, the, in, in our math and in the population and things like that. So we're going to have lists of assumptions for pretty much every procedure we learn. This is the assumptions for confidence intervals using the normal approximation, and that's the only confidence intervals we'll do for this class. It's all normal approximation for confidence intervals. Well, we'll use the T distribution, but it's basically the same thing. First of all, the sample observations have to be independent of each other. Your textbook talks about this, and there's two ways that independence can be screwed up for you. So to determine whether they're independent, one is just kind of thinking carefully and thinking, is there some reason they would not be independent, like they would be paired? So a classic example is snowball sampling, where each person in the sample um, actually went and recruited another person in the sample, and that person recruited another person. Well, the people who are recruiting each other 
this is not a random sample. The identity and the selection of the people in the sample is dependent on other identity and selection of other people in the sample, right? They're not independent of each other. But most of the time we can just assume this is true. So I would say if there's no evidence of crazy weird stuff going on in sampling, then just assume that this independence is true. But the other thing that messes with independence is if you have a gigantic sample, a sample that is a significant proportion of the size of the population. We've talked about this in the probability lecture, so we set a rule that is the same as the textbook's rule, it's totally reasonable. If the sample has 10% or more of the size of the population in it, then we should not be using these, process, these procedures here. There are other procedures to use, and they're not these ones. Because then the, the observations are not independent of each other anymore. Then you run into the problem where um, sampling without replacement has really started to affect your probabilities of sampling, and so your sample isn't, isn't random without replacement anymore. It's not independent. So first, and this is usually pretty easy, you just think, is the sample bigger than 10% of the population? Almost never. Um, in weird situations it might be, but it's good to think through that anyway. And then is there anything weird going on that I know about the sampling? If you don't know anything about the sampling, just assume it's random. Because for problems in this class, that's what we're going to assume mostly. If I give you some big hint that it's not random, then you can say we should not use the normal approximation. So that's the first condition. Condition number two is that the sampling distribution of the means must be approximately normal, which makes perfect sense. We're going to use the normal approximation to figure out areas in this sampling distribution. And so it better be normal, or at least close to normal. And generally, as a good rule of thumb, two things could be true. Either there's not very much skew in your sample, and n is greater than or equal to 30. And actually, it's okay to be less than 30 with your n, as long as things aren't, uh, as long as there's no noticeable skew, as long as it doesn't look like skews over like a half or one or something like that in any direction. So as long as things aren't really skewed in any direction, you can have less than 30. The textbook is all crazy about 30, but um, if you have little or no skew in your sample, you're probably okay if you have a random sample, even if the sample size is less than 30. But the textbook says 30, so okay. But if you do have skew in your sample, uh, like noticeable significant skew in your sample, then you can fix that skew in the sampling distribution by just increasing your sample size. Because as we've discussed, the bigger the sample size used to create the sampling distribution, the more normal that distribution will be. So if you've got moderate amount of skew, you might want to make sure your sample size is 40 or 50 or something like that. But if you've got ridiculous levels of skew, you might want to make sure your sample size is 100 or 300 or 500, something like that. So you can fix skew using sample size, which is very nice. <coughs> Sample confidence intervals are just a, a sample statistic, usually the mean from your sample, plus and minus a certain number of standard errors, just the right number. So as we talked about before, it could be two standard errors for a very rough 95% or 1.65 for um, a 90% confidence interval or 1.96 standard errors for 95% or 2.58 for a 99%. Anyway, it's just, that's all it is. It's a sample mean plus or minus a certain number of standard errors. So down and up from the sample mean. We can make confidence intervals any size from 0 to 100%, but the most common are 95, 90, and 99% confidence intervals. And we look up the z values in the normal table that will make that happen for a normal distribution, but for the normal distribution, they'll always be the same. If you want a 68% confidence interval, you, which is weird, every once in a while you might use that for a rough estimation of something or for a graph, uh, you can just say the mean plus or minus one standard error and that'll give you a 68% confidence interval. There's a diagram of what that looks like. The blue is the sampling distribution, the dashed line is the raw score distribution, and the purple stuff in the middle is the area, so 68%. And where the blue, blue vertical lines hit the x-axis, that's the confidence interval. Those are the lower limit and the upper limit right there. So the, we don't ever use this, but just to kind of get our heads set straight, at 68% confidence interval, you'd use a z of one. There would be one standard error for a 90% confidence interval, you would use a z of 1.65. So you would be counting 1.65 standard errors. So the z-score is just the number of standard deviations that anything, any particular observation is away from the mean, up or down, right? Well, standard errors are just standard deviations in this distribution. So when you say 1.65 times the standard error, it means 1.65 standard deviations in this distribution of means. So 1.65 standard errors.
that's a 90% confidence interval. Down and up 1.65 standard errors. 95% is down and up 1.96 standard errors, like that. And then a 99% is down and up 2.58 standard errors. So those are the, those are the benchmarks we're going to use. We're not going to use 68%. I might refer to it from time to time just to test your thinking on it, but this is what we use. 90%, 95, and 99, 1.65, 1.96, 2.58. If you know how to look them up, you can always look those up, but you can save yourselves time by like, writing them down on a scratch paper or something like that. So calculating this, we need to know the sample mean. We need to know the particular z value to cut off part of the, of the distribution, so cut off that middle part, so a plus and a minus z value. We need to know the standard deviation of the population of raw scores, and we need to know the sample size from our sample. A confidence interval is just a sample mean plus or minus the margin of error. So that's kind of what you're doing when you're calculating a, a confidence interval. You're just calculating the margin of error, and then you're subtracting that from the mean and then adding that to the mean. So we could write this whole formula this way. We could say the confidence interval for a certain percent. Now, alpha is the area in the tails outside the confidence interval. But we talk about alpha more than we talk about the inside area, which is called confidence level. So 1 minus alpha percent. So if alpha is 0.1 in both tails, then we have a 90% confidence interval. If alpha, if alpha is 0.05, then we have a 95%. So, this, so to find the confidence interval for uh, 1 minus alpha percent type confidence interval, so 95% or something, you need your sample mean plus or minus the absolute value of the z-score that cuts off half of alpha in the tails, because alpha is the area combined in both tails, so half of it is the area in one tail. So that's what this is saying, just the z-score that gives you half of alpha area in one tail. It's overly complex, but it, this formula encodes everything. Times your standard deviation of your raw scores in the population, so sigma sub x divided by the square root of your sample size. So this is the formula. You probably don't need all these subscripts because you'll remember what these things refer to, but to be super formal, everything is there. Now. We'll talk a little bit more about alpha here. That little note might help you a bit. Um, but let's do a graphical representation of what some of these things mean. Here's the sampling distribution of means. You can tell because I put x bar down near the axis somewhere. So these are means. These are not raw scores. So the sampling distribution of means, the mean of the means, which is the same as the mean of the raw scores, which is the same as your sample mean. In other words, it's our best estimate of the mean of the means and the mean of the raw scores. It's right in the middle. The standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of this particular distribution. It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of means. The confidence level, that's the word we use, or the term that we use to describe the middle percent. So if it's a 90% confidence interval, the confidence level is 90% or 0.90. If it's 95%, then the confidence level is 95% or 0.95, etc. And alpha is the area in the tails, both tails added together. So alpha divided by 2, or half of alpha, is found in each tail. So that helps explain that formula on the previous page, why we would have alpha divided by 2. and It seems kind of bizarre, but that's what we do. And then when we calculate, we find the lower limit, the upper limit, and that's it. We've got the confidence interval. Now you don't actually have to go through this whole thought process to calculate a confidence interval, but if, to pass this class you should probably understand it. Now one last little note here. We often talk about the margin of error. That's just the distance from the mean to either of the limits. So if it'll be the same this way as this way. Confidence intervals are symmetrical in the normal distribution. So the margin of error is the distance between the mean and the upper limit or the mean and the lower limit. So here's a formula written out kind of longhand up here. And we could apply it to the situation where we have a mean of 500 and a 95% confidence interval, so we'll use the z-score of 1.96. So that's the z-score here, but the raw, that's the absolute value of it, and we'll do a plus and a minus with it. And then you have um, the standard deviation for these GRE scores, as we've seen in previous lectures, is 100, and, this, and the sample size, let's say, is 16 for this particular example, so square root of 16. We could work out that formula. The best way to do this is do everything on the right of the plus and minus first. It's the most efficient way to get this done. So this reduces to 25, and that's the standard error there. And then 1.96 times 25 is 1.96 standard errors, right? That's, this, that's mathematically what's going on there. 1.96 standard errors is 49 points. 
So the confidence interval, some people would stop here and say it's 500 plus or minus 49, but in psychology it's more common to calculate out and, sh and share what the actual values are, 451 and 549. So let's talk about some of these pieces and link them to the terminology. These, these pieces all represent the standard error of the mean, or the standard error. Up here we have the formula for the standard error, and then we see it with the numbers plugged in, and then we see the final value here. That's the standard error of the mean. It's 25 in this case. This is alpha. This is our alpha level. It's not a hypothesis test situation, but alpha generally just means the area in the tails of a sampling distribution. So that's alpha right there. And it's 1 minus our confidence level. Our confidence level is this. So if alpha is 0 0.05, then our confidence level is 0.95. Now keep in mind we flip-flop back and forth between using percentages or proportions when we talk about probabilities, but if we reduce things to a mathematical level, it's always proportions. Some people will even say, won't even say 95% confidence interval, they'll say a 0.95 confidence interval. But I'm hoping you can do the flip-flopping back and forth. Just remember, if you're talking about percentages for, for probabilities or something like that, then whenever you want to plug things into a formula, you have to change it to a proportion or else the formula won't work. This is the margin of error. Basically, it's everything on the right of the plus and minus sign. So once you've got the margin of error, then you've just got two things to do. 500 minus that gives you this. 500 plus that gives you this. And you finally get the upper limit and the lower limit. And you list them in numerical order, starting with the lower. Does that kind of make sense? We count left to right in, in this society. So the standard write-up is something, there's variations on this, it's something like uh, the sample mean was you know, 2.58 seconds between insults. You can imagine what the study was, must have been like this. I had fun making up these examples. And then 95% confidence interval, and then in parentheses, you usually put the, the lower and the upper limits. Um, the standard technical interpretation includes this concept of confidence, of subjective confidence. You say we can be, or we are, 95% you know, confident. It's a 95% confidence interval, so we're 95% confident. The population mean of all whatever we are measuring, in this case inter-insult gaps, is between 2.28 and 2.88 seconds. And you might see other formats. Some, some fields will say the mean plus or minus the margin of error. Sometimes people use square brackets instead of curved brackets. Those are not important. The important thing is getting the numbers right and understanding what they mean. So when you're interpreting confidence intervals, here's some things to consider and maybe even mention when interpreting what the confidence intervals mean. Oh, that should be a capital I. That looks like C is. It should be confidence intervals, confidence intervals, CIs. Is it bigger or smaller than the confidence intervals in other studies that were done with similar methods and similar measurements? So other studies where you could compare directly, did you get a bigger or a smaller confidence interval? That's an interesting thing to know. Does it contain some meaningful value, like a null hypothesis value, for instance? Or perhaps does it just not contain it? And that tells you whether that value is plausible or not. And does it conform to a prior hypothesis? Maybe you have a hypothesis that the confidence interval should be about this big and it should be located in about this, this place on the number line. Does it fit that prior hypothesis? And, that, and then finally, is it plausible? Do the numbers make sense? Is one of the numbers lower than the mean and the other one above the mean? Um, does it look like it didn't quite go one standard deviation? Because if it's one standard deviation in the raw scores or more, then you did something wrong in your calculations. So try and figure out whether the numbers are actually making sense before you report this for a homework or a research report or a conference or something like that. So here's an example. A previous class uh, homework scores, you have to make an assumption here. Here's the homework scores. N equals 54. The mean of this distribution of homework scores is 57.2. You can see the gray histogram back there. And for some reason, we happen to know that the population standard deviation of homework scores is 18.9 points. So here's the mean, vertical bar. And now we can imagine a normal distribution here. And the mean of that normal distribution is the same as our homework mean, because that's the only estimate we have of what the population mean is. So we're trying to estimate all possible performances, perhaps, on this particular homework assignment. And we're trying to see how our students stacked up to all possible students, maybe, or how this sample stacks up. So the mean of all possible raw scores is like this, and the standard deviation is the same. And then we imagine the sampling distribution of the mean, which is skinnier. And the mean of that is the same as the mean of the raw scores. It's the same as the mean of, of our sample. 
but it's a much thinner distribution, so the standard error is much smaller. It's our standard deviation of the population of raw scores, 18.9, divided by the square root of the sample size, so square root of 54, so that should give 2.57. And then in there we can use um, just the z-scores and the normal distribution, the normal approximation to figure out the middle, uh, I don't remember, is this a 95% confidence interval? Anyway, the middle percent. And there we go. There's our confidence interval. 52.2, 62.2. Our sample mean is 57.2, our confidence interval is 52.2 to 62.2.